Um, at this point, I now welcome uh, Sam Myers from the Planetary Health Alliance, who is, uh, I think, going to introduce himself and giving us um, a first introduction to the topic that we haven't had uh, yet. So welcome, Sam, and thanks for joining at this uh, more early time for you. Well, what a pleasure to get to be here and what an important um event to have the launching of the Eastern African Planetary Health Regional Hub. I guess what I'll do is provide a little bit of a, of a broad kind of introduction to the field of planetary health. Um, so, you know, planetary health really has emerged out of this, uh, I think, unique moment in human history where, you know, by most metrics, there's actually never been a better time to be a human being. Uh, in the last 70 or 80 years, we've seen these really extraordinary improvements in uh, most metrics of human development. So, you know, the percentage of the adult population around the world who can read and write has risen from 42% uh, to 86%. Um, in 1950, there are 1.6 billion people living in extreme poverty and only 920 million people who are not in extreme poverty. And by 2015, there are only 730 million people living in extreme poverty and 6.6 .6 billion people who are not. So in that period of just uh, about 75 years or 65 years, uh, the percentage of the global population living in extreme poverty dropped from around 62% to around 10%. Life expectancy has risen very dramatically over that same period of time from an average of 46 up to 72, and child mortality has dropped by a factor of four from 225 to 45 deaths per thousand uh, births. But the same really sort of extraordinary scientific and technological developments that have fueled these impressive improvements in education and wealth and health across the global population in, in really just one person's lifetime have also been fueling this extraordinary expansion of humanity's total ecological impact on our planet's natural systems. And so if you look at these metrics of human consumption over time, whether you're looking at our appropriation of water resources or the proliferation of motor vehicles or the production and use of synthetic fertilizers or paper or plastic production or our primary energy use, you see these very similar patterns where there's a relatively modest consumption pattern. And then in around 1950, you see this steady rise and then this very, very steep, almost exponential growth in our global consumption patterns. And not surprisingly, if you look at our impacts on our planet's natural systems, you see very similar curves, whether you're looking at global biodiversity loss or exploitation of our fisheries or addition of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, the acidification of the oceans, or the loss of tropical and also temperate forests. And the reason that all of these graphs look so similar is that they're all underlain by these two really fundamental trends. One is the growth of the human population. And again, it was very steady for most of human history, started to rise around 1900 to 1950. And then this really steep acceleration in uh, the growth of the human population and that's been coupled with an even steeper increase in per capita GDP and the amount of goods and services that each one of us is asking the planet to provide for us. And when you multiply the fact that we have so many more people and that each one of those people is asking for so many more goods and services, you get this really extraordinary increase in the total human GDP and the net sum of all of our economic activity so that we're sitting on this almost vertical line today of increasing uh, consumption globally. And it's really hard to overstate the sort of total impact of that ballooning of our ecological footprint. So every year now, in order to feed ourselves, we've converted about 40% of the terrestrial land surface for just 
croplands and pasture. We use about half the accessible fresh water on earth, mostly to irrigate our crops. We're fishing 90% of our monitored fisheries at or well beyond maximum sustainable limits. We've cut down between seven and 11 million square kilometers of the world's tropical and temperate forests. We've dammed over 60% of the world's rivers and that is on the way to 92% over the next several decades. As, as Melvin mentioned, we're suffering from global challenges around air, water and soil pollution. And as you all know, we're disrupting the global climate system. And as a result of all of these kinds of changes in natural systems, we're driving the world's species extinct at about a thousand times the baseline rate. We've already lost around 65% of the mammals, fishes, birds, reptiles, and amphibians that used to share the planet with us about 50 years ago. Um, and about a million species are now facing extinction, many within the next several decades. So the, the scale of the human experiment, the scale of all human activity on our planet has just had this massive uh, ballooning and the sort of core premise of planetary health is that um, the scale of human activity now exceeds our planet's capacity to absorb our wastes or to provide the resources that we're using sustainably. And as a result, it's not just climate change, it's everything change. We're driving the sixth mass extinction of life on Earth. We're dealing with these huge issues around air, water, and soil pollution. We're changing biogeochemical cycles like the nitrogen and phosphorus and carbon cycle. Land use and land cover are changing rapidly. That's particularly true in Africa. We're dealing with resource scarcity of things like fresh water and arable land, and we're disrupting the climate system. And all of these sort of large scale human caused transformations of our planet's natural systems are interacting with each other in complex ways that we're only just starting to really understand to affect the core conditions for human health and well-being, the quality of air that we breathe, the quality and quantity of food that we can produce, access to fresh water, exposure to infectious diseases, exposure to extreme weather events, even the habitability of some of the places that we live. And the result is that these environmental changes writ large across the globe are affecting just about every single dimension of human health. And so just as we've come to understand that uh, there are really important social and cultural and even political determinants of human health over the last few decades, we're now coming to understand that there are also very important ecological determinants and that in fact human health is nested in a set of ecological conditions and that we are now changing those conditions at the fastest rate in the history of our species. So the area where I do most of my own research is in the effects of global environmental change on nutrition. As you can see, there are multiple different ways that changing biophysical or environmental conditions affect quality and quantity of food production. I've been doing research in, in three primary areas. One is showing that as we add carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, when we reach uh, levels of CO2 that we expect to reach in the middle of this century, our food becomes significantly less nutritious, that staple food crops like rice and wheat and maize are losing important amounts of nutrients like iron and zinc and protein. And when we look at how that will affect the sufficiency of, of intake of those nutrients for the populations of 152 countries around the world, what we find is that between 150 and 200 million people are likely to get pushed into new risk of things like iron and zinc and protein deficiencies just as a result of the carbon dioxide that we're adding to the atmosphere. We've also been working on how declines in pollinating insects are affecting the yields of pollinator dependent crops and what that means for human health outcomes because a lot of those crops are things like fruits and vegetables and nuts and seeds and legumes which actually provide a really important role in protecting us from 
non-communicable diseases like heart disease and stroke and certain cancers and diabetes. And so when we don't have enough of those foods, we see very large health effects. And then the last area is looking at fisheries and ocean warming. And we're seeing that as ocean temperatures warm, we see these big shifts in the distribution, the geographic distribution of where the fish are located with. Fisheries start to migrate away from where you are in the tropics and toward the poles. And that there also are changes in the size of fisheries. And that affects the health of you know around a billion people who depend on wild harvested fish to get adequate amounts of nutrients like omega-3 fatty acids and vitamin B12 and iron and zinc in their diets. And so there are around a billion people who are getting important contributions of those nutrients from wild harvested fish and are living close to a threshold where if they lose that contribution, they're in, at risk for becoming deficient. So those are areas where I um, do research. But again, these are just sort of a small uh, snapshot of some of the major issues around changing environmental conditions and human nutrition. Another place that we work actually is in East Africa and Madagascar, where we've been looking at how um, losing access to wildlife in the diet from bushmeat hunting actually affects the nutritional sufficiency of populations in northeastern uh, Madagascar. But of course, there are lots of other issues around how growing scarcity of water resources, uh, arable land degradation, uh, growing population displacement as people are being forced to move, um, pollution of both air and soil that affects uh, food production, and other kinds of surprises, you know, lots of things that are hard for us to anticipate right now as we're changing all of these biophysical conditions. Um, all of these different mechanisms that can affect the quality and quantity of food that we produce and therefore nutritional outcomes around the world. And of course, nutrition is just one dimension of human health, but we could have equally complex sort of conversations about each of the other major uh, dimensions of human health. So let me just give you a really quick um, snapshot of that. Melvin spoke about uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Clearly that's one example of how really a, a very risky relationship that humanity has developed with wildlife populations has come back to affect us, in this case through these live animal markets in China. But there are many other ways, as you know, uh, where we're seeing these spillover events between wildlife populations and human populations where these zoonotic infectious diseases are able to move out of wildlife populations and into human populations, many of them have already occurred in Africa, as you know. Um, and as we change these environmental conditions, it's not just our relationship with wildlife populations, but climate change is affecting our exposure to infectious diseases. In Africa, things like deforestation are associated with malaria, as you know, in Kenya, as it gets warmer in the East African highlands, we're seeing more malaria at higher altitudes. Um, we're seeing in particularly West Africa that with dams, we see really high incidence of schistosomiasis coming back into areas where it didn't used to be. Um, so there are lots of different ways that changes in land cover, climate, or the biological composition of, of communities all can affect our exposure to infectious diseases. In this example, uh, these farmers in Belize are adding fertilizer to their fields to improve their crop yields. What they don't know is that the nitrogen and the phosphorus that they're adding to their fields will run off from the fields into small streams and accumulate in larger streams and rivers and flow hundreds of miles down into lowland Belize where it enters these, uh, these wetland systems that you see at the bottom picture. And the addition of these nutrients of nitrogen and phosphorus actually can trigger an ecological shift where you get a different kind of vegetation and these typhal uh, vegetation that you see here, these sort of reedy vegetation types transition to a different kind of um, typhal vegetation, which turns out to be a better habitat for a different Anopheles mosquito. And so you start to lose the habitat for Anopheles albumanus and you see more and more Anopheles vestipanus. The problem with that is that Anopheles vestipanus is a very effective malaria vector uh, for humans. And so, you know, 
unbeknownst to these farmers up in, in uh, upland Belize, their addition of fertilizer to their fields is actually putting their lowland um, compatriots at higher risk uh, of malaria through this complex ecological set of shifts. And in fact, when this has been studied across six different continents, it turns out that this is the case much more often than not, where addition of these nutrients to these natural systems can lead to increased infectious disease exposure. So many of these effects are somewhat surprising. Not all of them are intuitive. Another area of uh, real concern is population displacement. And obviously in Africa, this is uh, a major concern that we're seeing uh, the highest numbers of displaced people uh, in the history of our record keeping. Uh, last year, there were around 66 million displaced people, about half of those are children, uh, and they're being forced to move for a whole complex variety of different reasons, but often at least one factor uh, is changing environmental conditions, severe droughts, crop failures. In some parts of the world, we're seeing uh, coastal populations at risk from sea level rise and more extreme uh, weather events. And around the world, there's a lot of concern that as we destabilize our natural systems, that certain parts of the world will become at least temporarily uninhabitable and people will be forced to move. And when they're forced to move, often they're not welcome in the places where they end up. And so that can be a source of increasing conflict. Um, we see malnutrition, we see infectious disease epidemics, we see uh, physical, uh, sexual and psychological trauma in displaced populations. And so there are very large health effects uh, of these forced migrations or, or displacements. Another dimension of human health that's affected by environmental change is non-communicable disease. And uh, Melvin mentioned pollution in East Africa. There was recently a big Lancet commissioned report on global pollution and health. They concluded that we're seeing around 9 million excess deaths every year as a result of pollution of air, water, and soil. And that most of those deaths are non-communicable diseases, things like um, cardiorespiratory disease, uh, certain kinds of cancers, heart disease, uh, and strokes. And um, a lot of that is from air pollution, but also from soil and water pollution. But there are other kinds of environmental changes that are also affecting non-communicable diseases. As I mentioned, the loss of pollinating insects is taking foods out of our diet that help protect us from those diseases changing the dietary, the composition of nutrients in our grain as a result of rising CO2 actually is putting us at higher risk of heart disease. In this picture in Bangladesh, we're seeing more and more intrusion of salt water into coastal aquifers as a result of sea level rise, more extreme storms and poor water resource management. And we're finding that the amount of salinity in the coastal groundwater that these people are drinking is very closely correlated with the risk of preeclampsia in pregnant women and also hypertension in adults in Bangladesh. And so again, a surprising finding that climate change would drive sea level rise, would drive salt water into these coastal aquifers, would create more preeclampsia in pregnant women in Bangladesh. But these are the kinds of sort of system-wide effects that we start to see. And finally, uh, we're concerned about significant mental health effects of changing environmental conditions. And, you know, it's, it's fairly intuitive that these major disasters, you know, things like the huge um, locust uh, outbreak in East Africa last year, or the fires that we're experiencing in California, or the hurricane season we've had this year in the United States, that these things are associated with enormous amounts of anxiety, uh, depression, sometimes suicidality, uh, loss of jobs, uh, and that there are huge mental health burdens. But we're starting to wonder more about the subtler effects as well. You know, what is the burden that we all carry of knowing that places that we love and cherish are, are changing in front of our eyes, that um, places that are of deep cultural importance to us are no longer going to be part of our family story? Um, what is the burden of knowing that our consumption patterns are actually putting the poorest people in the world in harm's way? And that's an area where research really still needs to be done. But I believe that 
there are going to be very significant mental health burdens of these environmental changes as well. So when you think about this big picture, the story I'm trying to tell you is that the scale of human activity has gotten so large that we're really transforming all of our natural systems at a very alarming pace and that those transformations are coming back to threaten our own health and well-being. And so when you think, well, so what do we do about this challenge? I think the answer is we need to go back upstream and look at what are the root causes. And the root causes turn out to be how we're living on earth and, and pretty much how we're doing everything, which is what's changing our natural systems. And so we really need a course correction, sort of the way that we're headed, you know, humanity is headed in a very dangerous direction where we're undermining the core life support systems that we depend on. And so we need to take a different trajectory. And, and one of the things that I think is really important to share with friends and colleagues is that there's a very bright future in front of us. There's no reason why, you know, our grandchildren can't live in a world where human population has actually stabilized and is starting to fall, not because of any kind of coercive practice or disaster, but because we're educating girls better, we're providing more economic opportunities for women, we're providing couples who want access to contraception, we're providing them access, and as a result, the population is starting to stabilize, that we've moved to a post-combustion energy economy and we're not relying on fossil fuels any longer and we're starting to get climate change under control, where we're finding these massive efficiencies in how we produce our food and our goods and services uh, so that they have much lower ecological footprints, where we're living in cities that are designed to really maximize our physical and mental health, but to minimize our ecological uh, footprints. And that you know, with every passing decade, there's actually more breathing room for the rest of the biosphere uh, as a result. And we call that process the great transition, that we're sort of trying to move toward this great transition where we're doing everything from food production to energy production to manufacturing and the economy, you know, circular economy to green chemistry, where we're doing all of these things differently. And the good news is that we know a lot of what we need to do already. So we have a lot of solutions available to us. I think in some ways in Africa, because so much of the world's population growth is occurring there and because cities are growing fast, there's an enormous opportunity for leadership in Africa in designing the world's future cities, in leapfrogging some of the technologies that have gotten us in the uh, global north into trouble, uh, in finding new ways to think about food production that include both sort of traditional things like agroecology, uh, as well as things like precision agriculture and some of the more innovative technologically based uh, solutions. And so there's an enormous opportunity, whether you're working in uh, urban design and the built environment or food systems or energy or business and the economy to come up with uh, solutions that are more in line with this uh, great transition. So um, obviously, we welcome all of you to be part of the Planetary Health Alliance. Uh, we have our big annual meeting, which will be virtual, that's coming up in April, and welcome anybody to uh, participate. Uh, and if people are curious about any of the things that I've been talking about, um, our book just came out on planetary health. It will be available uh, in Europe starting at the end of this month and is available in electronic copies as well.